Welcome back to Learn SKN, and today we're looking at the May June 2017 Agricultural Science Single Award Paper 2. And so we completed questions 1 through 6 in previous videos, and so we're going to continue with question 7 today. So we're going to look at question 7 for the May June 2017 Agricultural Science for CSEC Paper 2 Single Awards. Mouthful again. All right, good. Let's jump right in. List three ways in which perennial larceny impacts on agricultural sector. No, perennial larceny. That is the stealing of agricultural products produced. And so we know that, you know, it can be very impactful on the sector, very negative on the sector. Now, for one, I said it's list three ways, so it's just three. So for one, economic loss. If you're stealing the produce, then the farmer cannot sell them, and so the farmer going to lose money. So there's an economic loss tied to perennial larceny. That's one for sure. And then two, it can deter persons from actually entering the agricultural sector or remaining in the agricultural sector. So you can force persons to leave the sector. Well, what we mean by that is that if you realize you're working, working, and people stealing your stuff, you're not going to be encouraged to stay in the sector or you're not going to be encouraged to enter the sector. And so it deters persons from entering the sector, and so the sector is going to remain, you know, stagnant or not fully represented. So that's another reason. So one, economic losses. Two, it, it discourages persons or deters persons from entering or remaining in the economic sec the agricultural sector. And of course, thirdly, it reduces the supply of agricultural produce to the sector now what, what 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 i mean by that is if you are deterring persons from entering or remaining in the sector if you are stealing produce maybe for your own personal gain or whatever now that means that the supply for the market would be reduced because if, if suppliers leave the market leave the sector then that amount that they used to produce before is gone and also, if you're stealing for your own personal gain to feed the animals, whatever, then it's not out there on the market, the proper market for sale. And so that reduces the availability. I mean, sometimes there's the underground market where, you know, you know, a little people steal and sell. But for the most part, it also reduces the supply of produce on the formal, let me put it like this way, the formal market. So those are three ways in which it impacts the agricultural sector. That's A. Three max, boom, one time you get a tree max. B, a nursery propagates citrus seedlings. The graph in figure three shows the impact of additional workers on output. So you have the output stage one, stage two, stage three, number of workers. So a question they're asking here now, how many, four max? So they said, describe the impact on production of seedlings of hiring additional workers at stage two and three. So what they're testing here is your knowledge of the diminishing returns diminishing returns we keep adding a variable factor to a fixed factor you will see some increase in production but only to a certain point where it's that decreasing it's that increasing at a diminishing rate so this is where you said the graph represents here right you keep adding workers output goes up goes up goes up then it tapers off and then it start going down even if you're adding more workers and so you realize at stage two at stage two if you add additional workers your output is increasing still it's still increasing but it's decre increasing at a uh, slower rate than it was at stage one you realize stage one shoots up as you add more workers but then it starts you know bending to become a little flatter but at stage you're still increasing output as you add more workers but by stage three you start experiencing so it peaks in stage two and at stage three you start experiencing what you call diminishing returns where as you add more and more workers it's not really benefiting the output the overall output it actually goes is diminishing the output is going down you see output going down right there and if you look at the textbook it has an outline here in on page 242 you have this graph right here so they said the three stages let's zoom in a little bit on this one 
So, stage one, the total product is increasing rapidly. The end of stage one is the point where average product equals average marginal product. In stage two, both average product and marginal product are declining. So in stage two, average product, so output in stage two is rising, yes, but like I said, at a diminishing rate, is reducing. So the, the marginal, the actual marginal product is decreasing. So marginal product is declining. So the marginal output is actually declining, even though you, the, the output itself is increasing, but marginally, which means it's increasing at a lower rate than it was in, in, in stage one. So in stage two, both average product and marginal product are declining or the total product is still increasing, but at a slower rate than before, as I was saying before. Now stage three represents inefficient stage of production because total product and average product decrease and marginal product shows negative values. So it is costly to increase the variable input beyond this point where the total production, total product is at its maximum. So what I'm saying here is that this is not the, this is not the fully diagram with, with all of the, the 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 costs and things like that. It's just representing the total product. This diagram, and as you can see, the total product is increasing here, increasing here, but at a diminished rate, and then it start going down. Diminishing returns kicks in, so it peaks at stage two, start going down by stage three, right? So that's what this diagram is representing. So it's representing diminishing returns coming into play. So four marks right there. All right. C. The nursery operator has recently increased the wages of workers. Given the additional cost, the nursery operator decides to increase the selling price of each plant. So there's two ways in which farmers may respond to an increase in price of citrus seedling. Very easy. Very easy. Increasing price of citrus seedling. What I might do now is plant something else. Plant something else as opposed to citrus. That's one. And then two, they can sell their produce more expensive. They can raise the price of their produce. So that's two ways you can go there. You're going to either sell, the farmer can either increase it, plant something else, or go somewhere else. Right? So you have options right there. You can plant something else, increase your price, or simply demand less. So that's three things right there. You can demand less of uh, from nursery, demand less plants. You can increase the price of your plants to offset the increase in the, the cost, or you can just plant something else. You know, might not go to the citrus. So those are options you have right there. And this is suggest two, two max, boom, done. Then we have the last one here, three max. The government is seeking to attract new farmers to the citrus industry. Advise the government on three incentives it can provide to increase citrus production. Three incentives. So there are a number of incentives that a government can offer to farmers to keep them, to encourage them to produce. And so you have what you call price guarantees uh, in form of price support. You have subsidies. You have tax exemptions. Those are part of subsidies. So how can this, how, how, let's see how this works. Now, we're looking at the prices. Remember, we looked at earlier and they said that the price of the thing raised and then the, the, the farmer had to might have to increase the price, things like that. Now, what a price guarantee is, is the government refer, the government would say, okay, this is the price I guarantee you. Because the thing about f uh, agriculture is that the, the price of commodities tend to fluctuate. Sometimes they're high, sometimes they're low. Sometimes you may plant when they're high, expecting a large return. But by the time harvest time comes, the price drops and so you might be at a loss. So what the price guarantee is saying is that the government would buy this stuff from you at the guaranteed high price before you start planting. So whether the, the, the price goes down during uh, production, it doesn't matter because you're gonna buy it at that high price that you locked it into. But if the price goes up during the course, of course you're gonna buy it at the high price also. So the reality is, you are not going to really lose if you have a price guarantee. Because if the price goes down, there's still a maximum price or minimum price that the government is willing to pay that is greater than what the market might be offering now. And if the price goes up during harvesting and things like that, then you're going to get the high price. So the government guarantee us a certain price level that would always make sure you're not operating at a loss. And so that's, a, that's, that's one incentive right there. 
Next one is a subsidy. Now, a subsidy is a financial, it's basically financial assistance that can help the farmer to reduce their cost of production. And so you might see government do things like, you know, offer maybe free this, free that, maybe free land prep, reduce cost on fertilizer, reduce cost on seeds, subsidizing a, a variety of things. Now, all this in an effort to reduce the person's cost of production. So the subsidy helps reduce the cost of production. So a subsidy is an amount of money that a government is willing to pay a business to help business achieve a specific goal. Subsidies are sometimes given to a farmer to our producers so that they can develop their farm infrastructure, improve their technical operation, or even establish new agricultural enterprises. Normally, a government subsidy will pay only a proportion, a portion of the total cost. So it can either be, you know, money, as in cash money, you know, give a little something, stipend or whatever, or it can be in kind. Like I said before, if the government reduces the cost of inputs, like they take the loss. So let's say a bag of fertilizer costs $150 and the government sells you for $100, they are gonna accept that $50 loss on, their be on the behalf of the farmer. And so that would reduce your cost production. And so that's the next incentive the government can offer to, you know, such as farmers. And next one, of course, is tax exemption. And so this is where you have what you call things like duty-free import concessions, duty-free duty concession. Now, a lot of farmers are able to import vehicles, you know, pickup trucks from overseas at a reduced cost, at uh, no taxes, no concession, things like that. So that's a way the government can incentivize persons to improve their overall farming production by buying a new pickup truck, buying vehicles, even machinery, engines for fishermen, things like that. So the government would take off the tax because you're a farmer, take off the tax, take off the duty so that it can be cheaper to you as a farmer as opposed to a regular person. And so that's the next form of incentive that the government can provide the citrus farmer. So you have tree right there and it asks for tree. And so you outline those tree and you would have your full tree max. So that's it for number six, right? There are 12 full max. Number six is out of the way. So we have to jump into number seven next time. So make sure you stay tuned to Learn SKN to know when we drop number eight and eventually number nine that would end this paper, the May-June 2017 single award paper two for agricultural science all right so stay tuned for that one we have two more questions and that would be it all right so that is for now thanks for watching and thanks for listening